Amen. Thank you, and thank you for being here. And of course, we're now into the last night. Okay. Dale, do you need me to adjust this? Test, test. Is this better? Yeah? Okay, we're st into the last night, and hopefully it doesn't end here. I, I hope everyone's excited about being at the church camp. Right? Uh, okay. And continue to pray that it will be a profitable time for everyone right, at the camp. Okay? And, uh, okay, so we begin here. I don't know, do, Pastor, do we have some time for questions? I, I don't know, because we, we did have a few sessions last couple of days. I don't know whether there are some questions building up. Uh, we we? Have also okay, okay, so no, no problem. Okay, so if that's the case, then uh, no problem. So we, okay. Bef now, before I kind of get into the message uh, proper, let's, do this right um i'm just gonna very quickly follow on a bit about what we dealt with earlier today all right we were in matthew chapter 13 and uh there were two out of uh, actually a, a bunch of other parables that lord jesus christ uh taught everyone okay and uh you will see there in those parables that you, you notice uh, he dealt a lot with the issue of salvation Right, and uh, the difference also between true and false conversion, right? And how that the different kind of seed, eh, not the seed, but the different kind of soil actually determines the, the result. And so we need to be very careful as uh, if we're doing soul winning and evangelism that uh, to make sure that we, well, we know the difference because our goal is still that all will come to repentance, that all will be saved, right? Not just some. But uh, this will also help uh, prevent some of the disappointments. Okay, uh, many of these situations that you see, uh, you can have dramatic results or what look like short-term dramatic results. But then later you find that uh, you know by and by they they are offended because why tribulations and and uh, okay persecution will come and then people drop out and then we wonder why. Okay. And it has a ripple effect because it affects other members of the church. Okay? And it can be very discouraging. So it's important that we do it right. Okay? And um, in particular, one of the areas where it is very devastating to a church will be that when we don't get that right or we misdiagnose the problems, and so because of that, we apply the wrong solutions, um, it's possible to lose most of the young people in the church. Okay? And as soon as they're old enough, as soon as uh, mom and dad can no longer force them to come on Sunday, they are gone. Okay? And um, so we want to be able to prevent some problems. Now, understand this, that um, when we deal with these issues, that um, there is also a case for... Um, so we, we have to verify, we have to, we have to make right judgment, uh, but we have to make scriptural judgment. So, just turn with me very quickly and we we'll go to uh, Acts chapter 19. Okay? Acts chapter 19. And... Hang on, I just want to check my notes here. All right, now we turn to Acts chapter 19. I want, okay, I'm just going to use this as a short lesson before we actually get to the preaching. Now, it says here, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples. So he found certain people, they, uh, they were supposed to be disciples. He said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? They said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Okay. Now, I'm not sure why 
We, d- we don't have the details recorded in Scripture as to why Paul asked the question, but apparently there was grounds or reasons for him to ask that question, and what he did was to do some verification. Now, why did he ask this question? It wasn't, oh, is it because have you, been, have you spoken in tongues? Okay, some would like to, you know, the teachers say, have you received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? No. Okay, now he, he asked them this, have you received the Holy Ghost? Notice, since he believe so I want us to see something here that, that it's possible, possible to believe and make a profession of faith but the question was, would be if you are saved God would have given to you the Holy Spirit I think it was in Ephesians that he was described as the Holy Spirit or uh, he's described as the Holy Spirit of promise he's also we also describe that he also describes him as what that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. What is a seal? Okay, that seal is a mark of ownership. All right. Um, in the military, for instance, in the U.S. Army, they'll say maybe property of the U.S. Army. Okay. Uh, in the, for us, when I was in the military, we sometimes we have boxes and all that. It says property of the SAF, the Singapore Armed Forces. Okay, every one of us who are saved, there is a seal. Imagine a stamp, boom, says belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, what was that seal? The Holy Spirit. And for some reason, Paul felt that it was necessary for him to ask them that question. So, in asking that question and verifying, it was very interesting because the answer was very unexpected. They said, "We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost." They said. What Holy Ghost are you talking about? We never heard of that. We, we have no idea what you're talking about. So then, he, you notice he follows that up with another question. And he said unto them, Unto what then will ye baptize? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Now this is, was actually even more curious because if it was unto the baptism of John, now John preached very clearly that there was one that would come after him whose shoe latchet he is not fit to unloose, and he will baptize you what? with the Holy Ghost. He was the one that he told everyone, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Right? It's him that they must believe. Right? When Jesus came, what happens? The disciples of John went over and they followed Jesus, and they, they no longer followed John. That was his ministry to prepare the people for the coming Messiah. So, this is very curious because how is it that they could hear John's preaching? And remember, this is not because John's preaching was faulty. He was described as what? That he was the greatest of all men born, you know, born of a woman. He was the greatest prophet of all. He wouldn't have made a mistake like that. So they, he asked, he said, okay, what then will he baptize? He said, unto John's baptism. Now look at what Paul said. Then said Paul, John verily, surely, he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying on the, unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Now some will say, oh, you see, uh, you know, there were those that claimed, okay, right, John preached about you know, baptism, uh, sorry, uh, baptism of repentance, you know, that is a fa- uh, the repentance is a work, you know, you know the, the salvation that Christ uh, offered was a different. You no, know, you notice something here? Paul confirmed one thing. This was repentance and faith. He says there was a baptism of repentance and then this that they should believe on him that should come after him, after John, that is on Christ Jesus. There is, there is only one type of salvation in the scriptures. Now, he re-preached the message that John had been preaching. Why? Because in asking these questions and talking to them, it became clear to Paul they had no idea what he was talking about. Okay? They may have heard something, they may have believed, but understand when you, say, when you tell somebody something, how they understand and how they perceive it may be different from what you are saying. And that is why it is so important many times that we ask questions. 
All right. We ask questions. If you're a teacher, you understand this. You ask questions because it's very easy for students to say, yeah, yeah, I understand, I understand. After that, when you ask them a question, they I don't know. And so he used this as a tool, all right, in his evangelism or that to verify what was actually understood. And not only that, but in verifying, he found there was no evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. Now that is a problem. Why? Without the Spirit of God, there is no life. All right, there is no salv no salvation ha happened yet. Okay, these people were not saved because this was the mark of ownership, the seal. If you belong to God, God would have given you the Holy Spirit. Okay, now we have to understand also that the Holy Spirit of God is central to everything that we are able to do in the Christian life. Okay? What has happened, of course, in the last few decades is that many Baptist churches have become so afraid and wary of all the nonsense and all the, the uh, false teachings and all that uh, with, from the Charismatics and the Pentecostals that we behave as if there is no such thing as a Holy Spirit. Again, I want to point out one thing when you deal with the issue of contending for the faith is that you cannot counter error with another error. You cannot say, I don't like this, I will go 180 degrees in the opposite direction to the up extreme limit because the Bible truth will determine where you are, how, what is your distance from the error. Okay? And there is a clear difference. Error is error, truth is truth. Right? But you cannot counter that by just going in the opposite. And understand this, so much of it is central to the Christian life because without the Holy Spirit of God, what happens? There is a difference between saved and lost because 1 Corinthians chapter 2 tells us there is a natural man and there is a spiritual man. One who is born of the Spirit is the spiritual man. He has a new nature. He has a spiritual nature. Now, without that, what happens? The natural man in, in, still lost in his, you know, his, in, in, in his flesh. He cannot understand spiritual things. Right? If you turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Right, verse 14 says, But the natural man, notice this, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man, the lost, a lost person cannot receive things from the Holy Spirit. Why? For they are foolishness unto him. The human mind cannot understand spiritual truth. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. Not only its foolishness is, neither can he know them. It is not even possible. Do you realize for already a whole generation we're talking about, about, about what? We are trying to help those who are seeking after God. We have the seeker-sensitive movement. Do you realize that a seeker who is, you can be a seeker all you want or all, all you claim, but unless you are born again and you have that spiritual nature, you cannot comprehend spiritual things. Amen. Neither can he know them. Why? Right? Because they are spiritually discerned. They can only be discerned through by a spiritual nature. But he that is spiritual judges all things. Yet he himself is judge of no man. All right? For who had known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have. Notice we have the mind of Christ. Now, this is the starting point because once you have that, what happens? You now have the mind of Christ. You are able to look and appreciate and understand spiritual things, right? Uh, I think it was in First John, it tells us that our, we have this anointing and then what happens? The Holy Spirit of truth is able to lead us, teach us all things, lead us into all truth. Okay? Which is why I, I highly doubt that it is possible for the Holy Spirit of truth to lead you into error or lead you into a cult. In fact, that is our protection. You don't have to be worried about a cult or whatever because once you have the Holy Spirit of, of truth in you, he, can, he will never direct you that way. Okay. Now, why is this important? Because with, if you don't nail this right, the natural man cannot understand spiritual things. You cannot understand spiritual things. Now, that explains a number of things. How someone can sit there month, week after week, month after month, and you know what? On Sundays, they're thinking this is the greatest waste of time throughout for my whole week. Pastor is droning on and on and on, and it's boring. 
I have no clue what he's talking about. Right? Others have the supernatural ability. They sit here after the scripture reading and they are able to instantly fall asleep and then they instantly wake up just before the invitation. I have seen that with my own eyes, including one missionary in the Philippines. No, I kid you not. After he woke up, he came up, Pastor, he shook my hand. That was a, such a wonderful, good message. You are a real liar. Because I saw him throughout the whole thing. But it is not just tiredness because the instant the preaching is, is about to start, they're gone. And then they wake up again. And yet, here's the thing. We say, oh wow, you know, Pastor, you know, he's too bombastic and whatever, nobody can understand what he's saying. Really? You know, I can testify to you, I have seen a demon-possessed woman, all right? Each demon understand the King James Bible. And the, the person goes crazy every time we nail the verse as we read this aloud, it settles on a very major fundamental doctrine. And that's when the person becomes ultra-violent and we have to hold the person down. Although the person doesn't understand English. Did not understand English. And without these weapons, so it, the problem is, preaching makes no sense. It's foolishness. You can rant all you want, shout all you want, right? jump up and down, spit left and right, and guess what? No matter how much effort we put in into the preaching and challenging everyone, you know something? You're going to have someone who is unable to read more than three verses of the Bible in the whole year. Because the moment they open this, it's foolishness onto them. They cannot spiritually discern anything. They sleep. Solving the problem with an easier to read or so-called easier to understand translation doesn't solve the problem. Especially another thing you have to consider is a number of the, some of the most well-known Bible translators in our modern day era Okay, who translate from the critical text cannot even furnish you a testimony of their salvation. Go Google for that. You see, the, without a change, a supernatural miracle by God transforming us into that spiritual creature, right? In John chapter 1, it says, for as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And there is a change in transformation. Without that, what happens? You can't get the person to read the Bible. You, you, you can probably get them to memorize with no understanding. So now you have a problem. Fixing, so this is where we come into a whole lot of bad solutions. Oh, they can't understand. Okay, let's make it shorter. Right, we preach half an hour. Do you realize if it's foolishness unto me, according to verse 14, right? Five minutes of foolishness or five hours of foolishness makes no difference. It's foolishness. It's nonsense to me. Amen. Shortening it will not solve the problem. But shortening it right, or will shortchange the sheep. Without the Holy Spirit of God, there are no spiritual gifts. We went through this one time at the church camp, and uh, as we study, did the study on the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? The spiritual gifts and how to identify what they are and how to, you know and how we should use them, right? And Romans chapter twelve tells us to you know to deploy and use them within and serve one another within the local New Testament church. Um, you know something? To my shock and horror, there were those that have, in identifying those gifts, came up with zero. And they didn't want to highlight that to anyone. They did not want to tell anyone that. Why? No indwelling Holy Spirit, there will be no spiritual gifts. I found out the hard way in teaching and preaching about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how He works in the life of the believer that 
shockingly, during the preaching now, the pastor gets to see things that members don't see. Why? Because when I'm standing here preaching, and the, or the preacher is preaching, what do we see? We see everybody's faces and eyes looking back at us. And when it came to the subject of the Holy Spirit, what was shocking were the number of times that the, a great number of people stared right back with no comprehension at all. They had no idea what I was talking about. Another warning sign. Okay? No wonder... Okay? No wonder... Um, there are so many who will tell you they do not know what God's will is for their life. It's not something mysterious and hidden that you know you really only very few can dis- attain to it and discover what it is. Do you realize God's will is that He wants you to know His will? That's His desire. All right, but again, with how, without the work, in the, work, uh, the the Holy Spirit of God, what happens? No discovery, no understanding of that, no conviction. All right. Do you know that you know when we are changed into Christ likeness? Now I think it was in I think it was in Second Corinthians. Is it we're changed into the image right, of His Son? How by the Spirit? The, how are we changed into Christ likeness? By the working of the Holy Spirit. As we focus and fix ourselves on the glory of God. Right? What happens? We will be transformed. Who does the work? Not you. Not by your own effort, right? Not by your self-discipline. It's the Holy Spirit of God that does that. Again, if He's not there, there is no change. There can be no spiritual food. Okay? Now, to make it worse, again, one of the things I discovered firsthand was that just like in Acts 19, right? They said, we have not so much as heard there be any Holy Ghost, now, many try to cover for that because, how do they do that? By assuming wrongly that the Holy Ghost is about emotions. It's about feelings. Because the natural man can only understand the Holy Ghost by mapping that to that kind of understanding. A sensual emotionality sentimentality now when you have that or a church that is full of the natural men do you realize that the worship will be affected because it can never the music can never be spiritual but carnal and sensual because that is what the natural man needs To sing just now, uh, rejoice was singing. I looked, we looked, I, we googled up the words, and then we, and I was looking up the author who wrote the song and all that. And you know, when you see the spiritual truth, and as we sing it, you know, it, it rejoices the heart, it rejoices our spirit, refreshes us. But what happens that the natural man cannot comprehend all this? So what happens? It must seek out the things that will appeal to the senses. Emotionalism, sentimentality. You have to set the mood in the service. We have to set the mood during the preaching. Because why? Spiritual truth does not excite the natural man. It does not. So we need the theatrics. We need the you know all the loud dynamics. Like we have to shout and spit and get you know run around and ah, you know ah, do all this other stuff. Why? Otherwise, the natural man just simply says this is the most boring thing in the world. We need the entertainment. Why? Because you have to go back and diagnose the problem. The, at, at the right, at the most fundamental thing. There is no spiritual nature, it is a sensual nature. Do you see how everything is interconnected? Right? It will affect fundamentally the ministry of philosophy. Oh, sorry, the philosophy of ministry. Oh, sorry, I didn't have my coffee. Right? <laughs> the philosophy of ministry, how we do things, will be affected. 
That is why, without the Holy Spirit of God, what happens? You know what? We cannot bring out a, that there is a need or request, whatever, without guilt tripping everyone. You know, or shouting, screaming to everyone's face to until everyone feels bad that they have to now reach into their purse or their wallet to put something into the offering. Because why? There is no Holy Spirit to lead or direct. Do you realize where the Holy Spirit can get a hold of your heart, your, your wallet, your bank account, anything will open as long as the Lord will direct you through the Spirit of God. We don't have to twist someone's arm to do that. The problem is, he's not there. And that's why when you look at Jude, all right, it mentions that there are those that have not the spirit. Where was that? Uh, you see, in verse 19, these be they who separate themselves. Imagine they separate themselves from brethren. They separate themselves from sheep. Who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. There is spiritual deadness and the substitute is sensuality. Okay, sensuality is, like I said, it's not just sexual. Okay, and a lot of church and what we call church life may be all about feeling good. Because the natural man needs sensuality. There is no Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you joy even in the midst of affliction and suffering. Satisfaction even when you are lacking things. Paul had learned that in whatsoever state he's in, therewith to be content. And I think you, we, we've covered enough here to, to see that this is right at the heart of the issue because if there is no Holy Spirit, and that's why Paul addressed that question to the disciples of, of John. They thought they were disciples of John and yet they did not understand the teaching, the preaching, and the doctrine of John. Because if they did, they would have known about Jesus Christ. If they understood what he had preached, they would have understood that you know what, there was one who was coming and that he, he would baptize them with the Holy Ghost. They had no idea what he was talking about. And in dealing one-on-one -on -one with people, there were times that uh, when we teach about the Holy Spirit of God, you know what happens? Then someone comes, no, someone came one time and said, okay, how do I know I'm saved? I asked the question, I said, well, do you have the witness of the Spirit in you? Person paused for a while, then frowned and said, No, Pastor, I don't want to talk about this, all these emotional things and whatever. Just, I just want to, you know, just tell me something straight, simple, you know. Uh, and I said, But this is exactly what the scripture says because you have the Spirit of God in you or you don't. Which is it? All right, and. This will have everything to do with your assurance of salvation. How do you know you're saved? Because the Spirit of God witnesses to me. I know because He's there. He makes me sure that I know. Okay? Because if you don't, if you don't have that, what happens? There's always going to be the unknown. In fact, you, you're never able to tell. Now, If you turn to Romans chapter 8. All right, look at verse 16. It says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit. So two, this, this, two separate distinct things, right? The Holy Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are, that you are a child of God. Now what do Baptist discipleship materials today do? They'll take you through a whole set of scriptures and sometimes the pastor or the youth pastor will take you, tell you, okay, 
Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior? All right? Did you pray this prayer? Whatever. Okay, now you memorize all these verses. You can memorize all the verses you want, but if the Spirit is not in there to bear witness with your spirit that you belong to Him, you, have no, you will not have assurance. If, you, if we understand this, now we're going to see that the issue of assurance is tied very closely to the issue of the evidence. Firstly, of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the evidence of our salvation. And I'm not talking about our works. Either he is in there or not. That he had the, that had the Son had life, and he that had not the Son of God had not life. Why is there the life of Christ in you? Here, this is important because many people suffer from the issue of fear, okay, crippling anxiety and all that. And Paul wrote to Timothy and says, For God had not given us a spirit of fear, but our love and the power of a sound mind. It hinges also on the very salvation. Okay. Can we give in to fear? Possible. Paul experienced that. Right? But Paul also reminded Timothy, God did not give it to you. Okay? But here, spiritual understanding, if he will if he's the spirit uh, the spirit uh, of truth, he will lead us into all truth. Now John in his epistle said you because of that you do not need a teacher. Okay? Does it help to have a teacher? Yes. Because here's what happens during the preaching and teaching. The word of God is declared. We can read it. The Holy Spirit of God who is inside confirms that truth to us. Helps us to acknowledge, yes, we recognize that was true. Okay? We recognize it not because of how persuasive the preacher is. Okay? Not because of the strength of his intellect, but because the Spirit of God inside recognizes, yes, amen, that's right, that's, that's exactly right. Okay? Now, it bears witness with our spirit also that it says, yes, this is the right, this is the truth. Now, what do we do? We have the mind of Christ if you're saved. We understand that, we process that, we surrender. And we surrender to the truth. We're changed by the Holy Spirit, transformed into a greater Christ-likeness to be more like Him. There is a whole cycle, a whole process at work, which cannot happen unless somebody is saved. It cannot be faked. You see what I'm saying here? By the way, I do believe one thing in, in, in operating on a okay on an individual level that the spirit is also able to bear witness whether there is a brother or sister and you know what that we are family All right if you're safe you know that there times we've encountered certain people and something bothers us like why is it that there is no connection. We're not talking about how friendly we are or all those things. Okay? The Spirit does bear witness. No. He intercedes for us according to Romans chapter 8. Right? It's because of the Holy Spirit that we are able to cry out to God to call Abba, Father. Daddy! How? Not by teaching us that, oh, you, you say, oh, daddy, I, I don't know, I think the charismatics like, oh, daddy God, and when they pray. No, but we recognize from the inside, he is my father. There is a closeness and intimacy because of the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? Now, why is, that imp why is all this important? Because it is, let me, let me say this and hear me carefully. It is impossible to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit of God. Why? Romans chapter 7 tells us what? This is the good that I do, I do not. 
All right, I would not. But the, you know, the evil that I would not, that I do. Now, then Paul struggles with this he, until uh, verse 24. He says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Then he, he answers the question in verse 25. He says, I thank God through Christ Jesus our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, how do we walk consistently? How do we live for the Lord Jesus Christ? How do we serve the Lord the right way? Look at verse, the next verse. So here's a tip in, my, in reading my Bible. Okay, I draw an arrow from the last verse of chapter 7 to the first verse of chapter 8 because they are all interconnected. Because when you flow straight down from there, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation right, to them which are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to them who are saved. In other words, notice, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So how do we serve God faithfully in a manner that can please Him? You have to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Okay? Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. Now, we don't have time to d deal with all this, but Paul mentions in, I, I, I think it was in chapter 7, for I know that is in my flesh, he said, that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Right? Now, in your flesh, there is no way you can please God. Now, please understand what this means. The implication is this. All right? Therefore, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Romans 7 verse 18, right? In other words, if you live the Christian life, serve God through the strength of your flesh, do you realize you can never please God? No matter what you do, you can sing, you can preach, you can teach Sunday school, you can go soul winning, but if you do it in your strength of your own flesh, it's not accepted. God says, no thanks. Wait a minute. Okay, now we, we have a lot of us who agree with that. But here's the problem. Then how is it that the majority of Baptist churches we know focus so much on self-discipline on the rules and you must do this you have to do this do this to do this right you must keep to the schedule right um and because of that we what we see here is that there's a pulling back a retra retracting taking away of the, any liberty in the spirit We have this idea that, okay, if we can get everyone in church, right, to be in church on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, then they will have absolutely no time, no opportunity to fall in sin. And we're trying to work righteousness by the flesh. You cannot please God. Not only you cannot please God, can I point out, when you turn to Galatians chapter 5, it is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster because it only, not only will not lead to righteousness, you have to realize it will lead in the opposite direction. What you will reap is the opposite. Okay? Now, Paul made it very clear. Right? Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ died for absolutely nothing. Righteousness cannot come by the law. It cannot come by the works of the flesh. Alright? Because if that was possible, we wouldn't need Christ at all. We just needed to live a moral life. To be good enough, we can earn our way. Now, after we're saved, do you realize that you can still you still cannot work righteousness by the flesh? You will fail. And so because of that, Paul says there's no room for that, not even a little bit, because why in chapter five he says a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Okay? Now 
That's why verse 16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now there is going to be a conflict in the inside of every believer. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. You see that? What is opposing us from the inside? Our flesh. Your greatest enemy is inside. It's not the devil. It's this traitor called the old man. Right? Rejoice, you have an old man inside. <laughs> okay? The old you, before we were saved, that residue, that remainder of that sin nature is still there. Now, until we one day exchange this body for a sinless, perfect, a perfect one, okay, the old man, that flesh nature is there. Now, it says it is wrestling against the spirit. But the spirit is also wrestling, and they are both fighting for who will be in control, who will be number one. And, it says, and notice, these are contrary the one to the other. Now, here's a very important principle. The flesh is completely opposed to the very nature and person of God. It is as ungodlike as anything. Okay? That's why it says because of this inner conf conflict then, and by the way, that conflict and struggle from the inside only happens if you are born again. If you have that new man in you. Before that, I was proud of the things I did, my lying especially, because I never got caught. And I told you before, when I got caught or got, and I got accused of lying was when I was actually telling the truth. That was how bad it was. So you cannot. But look at verse 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Okay, now so when you look at verse 19, then it tells us now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Okay, what are the works of the flesh? It says they are very clearly seen or demonstrated. How? What are these? Adultery, fornication, all right? uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred. Right, variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness. And by the way, murders includes if you hate your brother, you are a murderer. Just like Cain. And what did John say? Remember the apostle of love? And you know that no murderer had eternal life in him. It's a lost condition. Okay? Murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. This is of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It says, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. What is this? The works of the flesh. You notice people who live there habitually, who are in a lifestyle doing these kind of things. Is this, this is characteristic of those who are on their way to hell, all right? who are not saved, who are not born again. And yet, today we have weaved and twisted things to what happens? To now explain the way that some of these should be accepted as normal among pastors or among members. Really? Paul rebuked the Galatians. He pointed this thing out. Now, one of the reasons why he had to deal with this, why did he tell them to walk in the Spirit? All right? To walk in the Spirit so that, uh, and he says, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. Now, this is a very simple principle. When you and I walk in the Spirit, you know what happens? It will free us from sin, from the power of sin. You cannot set yourself free from the power of sin by the power of the flesh. Righteousness cannot come by your self-discipline. Now, what happens when you have churches that emphasize that? you will see that when you scrape underneath the surface, the scandals are there. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, so on and so forth, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunk. You know why? Because every time you work righteousness by the flesh, you strengthen your own flesh. 
while trying to work righteousness in the attempt in the failed attempt to serve God and when you strengthen the flesh it's like a monster it will come back and bite you you see what I'm saying here it will what sets us free to be able to walk with the Lord to serve him without that kind of problem is when you and I do it by walking in the spirit okay you have to walk by in the spirit you have to submit to his leading in every area of service and everything that we do each day of our lives constantly because if you don't do that okay now it all this means it when you once you understand this it changes the, the way we solve problems because what happens yes is it possible someone can sit there during the, the conference right now, all through the conference and they are on Instagram? Yes? One way to solve it by the works of the flesh is this. We will ban all phones when the moment you enter through the door. Right? A deacon will stand there and then you put your phone into the basket. Right? At the end of the service, you pick it up. We can do that. Right? We invest a bit more money, we can put the device here to jam the signal so that nobody can receive anything. Okay? Now, many pastors are trying to solve the problem that way in church. No phones, no devices. All right? They say, wow, this is not a Bible. This is a real Bible. No. This is a... Bible, Bible in book form the real Bible is in a scroll we want to get into that kind of competition we'll see who can spit the furthest distance you know how ridiculous it gets now the point I'm making here is that you can attempt to solve all this and merely all we're doing is constraining the flesh one of the weirdest stupidest excuses I've seen okay now I, I believe in modest dressing but I believe our reasons for modest dressing, whether male or female, because it applies to males also, must be based on scripture, not based on men's teachings. They say, oh, well, you know, well, that's true. The women make sure all the women are modestly dressed, whatever, otherwise the men are going to sit there in church on Sunday and they'll last in their heart. Okay? Let's have a men-only service. Let's have a women-only service. Let's not pretend because no matter how modestly dressed someone may be, okay, I'll give away the secret. Ladies, do you realize men have the special ability in their head that no matter how fully and modestly dressed you may be, they have the ability in their head to remove all your clothing. It's in their sin nature. Last month, I pointed out to our members, said in church, uh, in, I pointed out to our members in church. He said, "You know, there was a there was a case in Singapore. The man, the father, sexually assaulted his own daughter, and he is legally blind." I pointed out, a blind man can last in his heart. He cannot see anything. He can still last, right? Because if we want to avoid prevent that problem of lust and all that, okay, why do we blind all the men? It won't solve the problem because the real problem is inside. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because we have now come up, for after a couple of generations, uh, have now become churches that are famous for coming up with stupid solutions that are not based on any scriptural sense. Okay? And we're trying to fix the wrong problems while emphasizing the, the wrong solutions because all works of righteousness by the flesh, you are doomed to fail. That's why those that only have strict standards without the work, outside of the working of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, set themselves up for failure. Because when you scrape underneath the surface, you dig down enough, the works of the flesh are manifest which are these 
adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, so on and so forth. And then it says, and they that which, which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Where this is habitual, with no power to break this, it is indicative of someone in a lost condition. That's why you see here that there is no substitute for salvation. This is, now, on the other hand, look at verse 22. But, but the fruit of the Spirit is in singular. Right? English teachers is in singular. Whereas in the earlier part, in verse 19, the works of the flesh is in plural. The fruit, one singular fruit. If you have the Holy Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, that, uh, such there is no law. Now look at the next two verses. It tells us, now, how, how, do the, how, how can you and I as believers be victorious? And they that are Christ, that means they who belong to Christ, right? have crucified the flesh. You cannot make the flesh alive or strengthen it. And the worst way is what? By working righteousness through the flesh. Instead, they crucified, killed it. How? And then we're together with the affections and lusts. Okay? Notice uh, the affections and lusts. This is in oppos total opposition to people who say, Oh, but don't you know, Pastor, I'm a very passionate person. You have not crucified your affections. The stirring of those kind of affections are, the danger is this, we may be stirring the flesh rather than that the spirit in us is stirred. And the danger becomes so many things that we may see in church are actually a fleshly substitute for true spirituality. Okay? Verse 25 tells us, if we live in the Spirit, what should we do? Let us also walk in the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? If we live in the Spirit, that means if you and I are saved, and if you and I have are alive now in Christ because of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God, right, that the Spirit of God has now made us into a new creature, we're alive, then we also need to walk in the Spirit. Now, the first part comes automatically the moment you and I were saved. The second part is a volitional choice that you and I must make. Let us also walk in the Spirit. But realize what Paul is telling us here is that if we don't do that, we cancel out the work of grace that Christ has done in us. That's why going back to the beginning of chapter 5, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Alright? Verse 4, Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You, you have abandoned grace altogether. You have abandoned your dependence on God's help to live the Christian life. Why? For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Right? Righteousness cannot come by the works of our flesh. That's why we live by faith. Paul said, uh, it was what? Uh, chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. What, what do you say? Saul of Tarsus is dead. Mati. Right? Did I get it right? Yeah. Mati. Matai. Oh, okay. In 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 Malay and in Mindanao, I think it's Mati. <laughs> okay. Now I said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Okay? So he's not talking in mysteries. He's saying, I am dead, but I'm also alive. How am I alive? Yet not I, but says Christ liveth in me. Christ is living in me now. 
And because of that, it says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, in this physical body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, right, who loved me and gave himself for me. So he's saying there was a substitute, an exchange that Christ now lives in me. Because of that, now the works that will flow from my life are Christ working out these things in me is not because of me, not because of my flesh. Then how say some Baptists that, oh, you are teaching a work salvation if you say that after someone is saved, there will be fruits. Of course there are fruits. You know why? If Christ is in you, there will be fruits. Christ will be the one producing the fruits. Well, are there works after we're saved? Oh, yes. The work of God, the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ Christ working in me, Christ producing the works. He is the vine, we are the branches. The life of Christ flowing through the branches produces the fruit. And so many of those arguments, what is shocking is this, as they present the counter arguments, it reveals one thing. They have no idea, no concept of what the Holy Spirit is doing or what happens when we're saved because why? it has not happened in their lives. It is not a reality for them. That is why there is such a vehement and violent opposition. Because you will know it, if that had happened to you and Christ liveth in you, you, would, you, once you see these passages, once it's taught to you, you explain, ah, I know, I get it. So that's what's happening. Unless it's not a reality for you. That's why they say, they, they misunderstand immediately say, oh, no, no, that's, this works. You know, it's, it's just doing it by your flesh. Because for many people, that's the only way that those things can happen in their life. By the works of their flesh. And that's why the only way that, the, like I said, the common misunderstanding is that what flows out and the working of the Holy Spirit, they mistake it instantly that this has to do with emotions because the natural man can only understand sensuality. He cannot understand spirituality. So when you understand this now, when you look across the whole landscape of modern Christianity, what you're going to see is a very scary picture of what is mostly false out there. Man's attempt to fake all these things without Right? outside of the work of the Holy Spirit of God and of the Son of God and the Father. Can you see how in modern Christianity it's a huge mess and it's mostly lifeless as a result. Now, just got to wrap up some thoughts here. Now, by implication, this means this. Many of us here, in attempting to go by the works of the flesh to produce righteousness after we're saved, you know what's happened? We have fallen flat on our faces many times. Some of you have failed very badly. You have messed up so much that you sometimes wonder, can God ever use me? Let me encourage you tonight. If we live in the Spirit, let me invite you tonight to also walk in the Spirit. Amen. All right? Try it for once. Seek out, if you're still not sure, seek out those answers. Study, dig deeper. To realize that what the Lord has given to each and every one of us after we're saved, do you realize there's tremendous power that God has given to us? And what the devil does, doesn't want you, to, what he doesn't want you to know is that you have all that power to counter him. As long as you are ignorant, he will always be victorious. Okay, it's kind of like playing a computer game against another person. If that person knows that you do not know that there's your, you have this certain function, you press this key com button combination, whatever, you can actually defeat him. As long as you do not know that, he will always win. And some of us here, we've walked away. Right? We tried, we tried so hard by our own effort and we have failed. Can I invite you tonight? Come, fully surrender.
cry out to the Lord, I'm not going to try to f- work this out on my own anymore. You take over. I need your strength. I need your power. You have given me the Holy Spirit, but now I want to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to walk in the fullness of the Spirit. You take over. You make me fruitful. Right? But I will step out of the way so that you can be the one in the driver's seat. Right? Tonight, some of us here need to get off the throne. Step aside and invite the Lord. He is Lord already. But some of us have not crowned Him as Lord in our lives. We have not said, Lord, you have free reign. You have full permission to do whatever you want right, in my life. I want you to take over. I want to walk in the power of the liberty that Christ has given to us. I wasn't planning to preach this actually but it looks like this is now the main message but understand this that once we get a handle of this truth you, you know how liberating it is you know how empowering it is do you realize how much of a leap and bound you can make in your walk with the Lord even though you and I know how imperfect we are and if you were to point out all my faults and my limitations, well, I will agree with you and I probably will add a few more. Right? I'm far from where I need to be. But we're still able, I'm still able to do what the Lord needs me to do as long as I allow Him to take over rather than try to be the one driving. Okay? Some of us here Okay, Romans chapter 8 also has this other passage that says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, it says they are the sons of God. Amen. Does your life show the leadership of the Holy Spirit? If it does, it will be seen in the way you make your decisions and choices concerning your life. Those, every decision, it will be evidence that He Okay, you belong to him, you, that you are a son of God. But we can get in the way. We can block and hinder the work of God because we want to be in control. That's why it tells us that the flesh lusteth against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. Now, Reggie, come. Okay? Flesh lust, that's the flesh, right? That's the spirit. Now, what happens is this, okay? Imagine this WWE, ah, okay, and, and they're fighting and wrestling now. How do we win? Okay, because you can neutralize each other, you can hinder the work of the Holy Spirit. And the, all right, so what do we do? We crucify the flesh, knock him out. All right, unless you mortify the flesh, what happens? always a struggle that's why some of you as much as you are safe and spir- and have moments of spiritual heights your life is a roller coaster you know why your spirit is your flesh is strong and the spirit is strong and then they depending on which moment and you're going up and down up and down for some you are carnal because you have allowed the flesh to lead you Those in music ministry, you have to be very careful. Are you led by the Spirit or you are allowing the flesh and your sentimentality to lead you when you're serving in the music ministry? Emotionalism stirs the flesh. Now, I'm not saying that we should be all dead and unemotional. Can I say this? When you are close to the Lord, there are many times in singing a hymn and recognizing a very precious truth, I cannot stop the tears. Sometimes I cannot sing properly because I, I choke on the tears. Because that truth hits me to the very core of my being. Sometimes I just want to get up, stand on somewhere and shout. Okay, But it's not based on stirring 
the flesh so that we now are excited. Do you realize that you can be excited and have great joy even in the midst of great trials? Why? Because that's, that's something only the Holy Spirit can produce. Okay? The other way, there are many ways to produce that. Entertainment, excitement, fun, you know, comedy, alcohol, food, and friends. There are many ways to stir that. But you know when it's hurt, when you're hurting, when you're going through the lowest point, only the Holy Spirit can still give you joy in the midst of all that. All right. Now, like I said, we have retreated so far from these biblical truths and this very important doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Because why? To counter the error, we are so afraid of the Pentecostals and the Charismatics. That there are many Baptists who have grown up in the Baptist church who have not so much as heard there be any Holy Ghost. And because of that, preachers have robbed their churches of the power, the very source of power that we need in our walk with Christ. Without that, you realize that with the power of the Holy Spirit, you can preach with a soft voice and the Holy Spirit can smash through concrete and the hardest of hearts because it's not about my, the might or my flesh or my voice or any of those things alright and so tonight as we kind of just wrap this up I want us to realize your, the programs and all those things will not turn us into a powerhouse that power, that power is tapped. That, that power is going to come from the Holy Spirit of God. Only those who are saved have the Spirit of God. Right? Only those of us who are cooperating with the Holy Spirit of God will be able to walk and grow and mature and, and fruit will come from our lives. But you and I can hinder that work. So who tonight, as we close here, who tonight will come before the Lord and say, Lord, whatever it takes, give me that power. Let me tap on that power. I will walk in the Spirit. I am alive in the Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Help me to walk in the Spirit. Show me how. Help me to take those first steps. Then fill me with thy Spirit. All right? The filling of the Holy Spirit when you look at the passage there, you know, the way it's worded and the tenses it actually has to do with a continual filling. You continue to fill it. You, your car needs to continually reinflate the tires. Okay? It's not a one time thing. We need that, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, in order to be productive and to serve the Lord. Only then can you and I teach or preach boldly in the Spirit. Right? The early church, men who were once afraid, who ran for their lives because Jesus was arrested, now stood before a hostile crowd and preached boldly because of the Holy Spirit. Do you realize the deacons were chosen? Men full of the Holy Ghost. This is not something for ultra spiritual Christians. God's desire is for everyone to be filled. Now, how do you f- be filled? Um, do you have the, the passage? Is Ephesians uh, 5, I think. Do you be, f- be filled with the Spirit. Alright. Now, think about this. How are we filled? Filling of the Spirit is not a spiritual condition. It is a commandment. It's not a condition. It is a commandment. What do you mean? It's not something that we work ourselves up, work ourselves, and somehow that woo, we reach a high and we're filled with the spirit. No. Is it be not and you notice the wording and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Notice, but be filled. 
with the Spirit. That was an instruction. You have to ask the Lord to fill you, to allow Him to fill you. If He fills you, remember what I mentioned about the dedication of the temple and the tabernacle? There will be no room for men. Where God fills up this place, there is no room for men. No flesh will glory in His presence. When God filled up the temple, all right, the Spirit of God filled the temple, His glory filled the temple, what happened? The priests could not enter. Poof! They were all kicked out through the door. There will be no room for self. There's only the filling we're full of the Savior. There will be no more room for what I want. It changes our praying. My prayer will be, Lord, whatever you want. It's an instruction. Be filled with the Spirit. Alright? Now, tonight, I want to ask you, will you allow Him to fill, to fill you completely. That means you have to get out of the way. You have to step aside. Right? You have to allow him to be the one to now do the driving. If there are two people trying to drive and they're grabbing the steering wheel, there will be an accident. There can be only one driver. God's not interested in being your co-driver. If he's not the driver, he's not even in the car. You see what I'm saying here? So who tonight will allow him, invite him, Lord, you take over from now on. This throne is yours. I will get off from the seat. No longer my way, it's your way. The choice is yours. This is an instruction. It is not a condition. You can't work your way until you reach level 10 or something and then you're filled with the Spirit. No. He says, do it. Tonight, will you do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this most unexpected turn as we dealt with the Scriptures, but it is your word and you can direct it and the teaching, the preaching of this in any way you want. Lord, I have tried to step out of the way so that I can be an instrument that you can direct in terms of the teaching and the preaching. Lord, everyone here has heard what you have to say, what you have for us to know. I ask and pray right now that our hearts be tender and yielded and ready to do business with you. Help us, Lord, to deal seriously and to be committed. But Lord, be thou pleased even with our surrender as we yield to you. Have your way with us. Have mercy on us. Give us grace that we will do what is necessary and we will allow you to take control so that we can be fruitful for you to bring glory to you. Father, we thank you for what you're about to do. Have your way with us. And we ask this in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor.